Well, welcome to everyone. Thank you so much for coming this morning if you're on the West Coast or in the afternoon if you're somewhere else in the U.S. or in the world. I'm so glad that you've come this morning to this session on helping our children see that biblical faith is not blind. Now, I know that some of you I met last night in our session and even some of you in previous years in person at Mission Connection, and I'm really sorry that we cannot be here to there together this time, but I'm so thankful for the technology that God has provided so that we can be together virtually. Um, for those of you who I haven't met before, my name is Elizabeth Urbanowitz, and I always tell people all you need to remember is Elizabeth because Urbanowitz is one of those impossibly long last names that's really hard to remember. And I always tell people I'm praying that if God one day has marriage in his plan for me, I'm praying he'll bring a tall man with a very short last name. Now, um, at the end of this time, the our hope is to have some, some time for questions. So if you have questions throughout, if you could just type those into the chat and then at the end, we'll get to them and talk through them. Um, my goal is to have about 10 minutes at the end of our time together. Now, the way that I got into this this ministry of apologetics for kids, of helping our kids see that biblical faith is not blind, is I spent the first decade of my professional career as a teacher in a Christian school. And during my first five years of teaching, I had absolutely no idea what the word apologetics even meant. If you had said that word to me, I would have said, Apollo, what? Is that like apologizing? But the way I got into this field is as I was teaching, I saw that the students in my classroom, they came from these great Christian homes. I was giving them a biblical based education all day long, and most of them were fairly involved in church, but I saw they were rapidly absorbing ideas without question, and they were mixing them in with the Christian worldview. Just one story that stands out um, in my mind when I think about this is it was about my fifth or sixth year teaching, and I was using a projector to project um, the classroom slides for a lesson on the board. And halfway through the lesson, the classroom projector went on the fritz. And I gave my students an assignment so that I could figure out what was going on technology-wise. And as I turned to go fiddle with the wires of the projector, I heard one of my students say, guys, this is so stressful. We should totally meditate to stay calm. And by the time that it took for that comment to register what the student had said and for me to turn around and address it, half of the students in my classroom were on the floor sitting cross-legged with their eyes closed closed and their arms out like this saying, um, um. And while it was kind of comical, it was also a little bit shocking that someone had just said the word meditate and immediately my students went to this Eastern form of meditation. So when I recovered kind of from my surprise and a little bit of humor from that, I said, okay, boys and girls, we need to talk about this for a second. You know, the type of meditation you were just doing is not the type of meditation that comes from a biblical worldview, that this type of meditation comes from Eastern religions where we're supposed to empty our minds of everything. And as I was talking, I just saw these blank stares on their faces. You know, I might as well have been talking to them in an Eastern language. And I just kept seeing this over and over and over again, that my students were rapidly absorbing these ideas from the culture. Another time I was going around and I was just working, the students were working on handwriting and I was going around and I was correcting some of their mistakes in handwriting. And one of my cute little third graders looks up at me after I made a correction on her paper and she goes, don't judge me. And I actually laughed out loud because that was not what I was expecting to come out of her mouth. But then we had a conversation and I said, oh, so what was I doing? You know, when I was just correcting you, is there a right way to make this letter? Is there a wrong way? As your teacher, is it my responsibility to correct you? So we talked through that, but she had just absorbed this idea of, oh, you're not supposed to judge me. You're never supposed to tell me that I'm wrong. And the more and more I taught, the more that I saw that my students could parrot back to me the things that I had taught them, the things that I had taught them about God and about the world, but they weren't really critically thinking. I even included some times in my classroom where I would show them like a clip from a popular TV show or movie, and I'd ask them to evaluate it. And the deepest they were able to go was to say, uh that's bad. <laughs> and they weren't really able to critically think through, is this true? Is this good? 
And then as my students started going up in the grade levels and I saw them progress, I saw that many of them just viewed Christianity as, oh, that's something that we do at church. That's something we talk about at school. It wasn't this all encompassing worldview. It was like faith was supposed to be something that was blind. And that is not what we want for the children that God has placed in our care. We want them to know that he is the creator and sustainer of all reality and that all of reality points to him. So today we're going to go through a bunch of different things that we can do with the kids that God has placed in our care to help them see that God is the creator and sustainer of reality. But before we dive into that, we're just going to spend a moment to just lay this session before the Lord and ask that the Holy Spirit would be at work in our hearts and our minds today. So if you please pray with me. God, I thank you so much for this opportunity that we have to meet together, Lord, that we just have to step back from our busy schedules and look at what you've called us to do with the children that you have placed in our care. Lord, I ask that you would guide this time. I ask that you would remove any distractions. Lord, I ask that your Holy Spirit would be at work in our hearts and our minds, that you would bring to our attention the things that you want us to glean from this time together today. Lord, I ask that you would guide my words. I ask that anything that's not from you would just fall to the side. And Lord, I lift up all of the children that are represented by the people who are in this virtual room right now. Lord, I ask that you would soften these kids' hearts towards you. Lord, that you would give them minds prepared to think critically, Lord, that ultimately they would choose, Lord, to be reconciled to you, Father, and that they would joyfully enter into your mission of reconciling the world to themselves, yourself. Father, we love you and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we go on today, I'm going to be talking about our kids, and you may have your own biological kids, or you may have adopted kids, or you may be working as a Sunday school teacher or a pastor or a youth leader, or you may just care about the kids who God has placed in the body of Christ around you. So just know when I use the term our kids, I'm talking about all of us in the body of Christ, reaching out to the kids that God has placed within our sphere of influence. Now, I mentioned before we prayed just how I saw my students rapidly absorbing ideas from the culture. And then as they got older, just slowly pushing Christianity to the side. And now this has been, has been something that researchers have confirmed for a long time. Different researchers have found different statistics of how many children end up leaving the faith. I usually like to take more conservative numbers. Um, and one of the most conservative numbers that you can find is from a Barna study done in 2011. And the, the results were reported in the book called You Lost Me by David Kinnaman. And in that book, they found that over 60% of young adults who went to church as children and as teens dropped out after high school. And when they followed up with many of these young adults, they found six common reasons why young adults left the faith. And now spiritual formation involves, it involves the heart, it involves our affections and our desires, it involves the hands, it involves the things that we do, the places that we go, and it involves the head, the things that we think about. And these researchers, they found that four out of the six common reasons that young adults walked away from the church was intellectual. They were intellectual reasons. Now, this does not mean that uh, the faith of the head, the faith of the mind is more important than the faith of the heart or the faith of the hands. All three are equally important and necessary. But what this does show us is that the head tends to be the area in which we are weakest right now in raising up disciples. And so we need to begin equipping our children to understand the truth of the Christian worldview. Because when we look at research, even many of those who stay within the Christian faith, many of those who are not part of that 60 plus statistic, who choose to stay and still identify with the church and as a Christian, they still can't think critically. I saw this several years ago in a story that was somewhat comical. Um, I was teaching the third through fifth grade children's church class at the church that I was attending. And between services, I was out in the coffee bar area working on something. And one of the boys who was typically in my class saw me in the coffee bar area. And when I said hello to him, he goes, oh no, it's you. 
And I kind of chuckled and I said, well, it's really great to see you too this morning, Samuel. Why are you so excited to see me? And he said, well, seeing you here means you're probably going to be our teacher. And I hate it when you're our teacher. And this kind of surprised me because I thought my students normally liked being in my class. And so I said, why is it that, you know, that you don't like it when I'm your teacher? And he goes, because every time I come to church, I say Jesus as the answer. And the teacher is always fine with that, except for you. Every time I say Jesus as the answer, you make me explain why. And it makes me think, and I hate that. You're not supposed to think at church. School is the place you do the thinking. And I kind of chuckled and I said, well, I know you did not mean that as a compliment, Samuel, but I took that as a huge compliment. But what he said, which was somewhat cute, reveals this problem that we tend to shy away from viewing, helping our kids see that Christianity is this all-encompassing worldview, that it's rational, that it's based in reality, that we don't come to the Bible, we don't come to church, we don't come to the body of Christ with our minds turned off. We come thinking critically because God is the creator of our minds and they are to be used for his glory. Last night, if you came to my session on truth, I showed some statistics that showed the conflicting beliefs of evangelical millennials, that even many of those within the church, they have conflicting beliefs. I'm going to show some of those statistics again right now. If you were in my session last night, I need to apologize. You're going to see one of the same statistics. I realized last night I used the data from 2018 where I should have updated it to 2020. So today you'll see the numbers are a little bit different because this is the updated information from 2020. So I'm going to share my screen with you here. Okay, now this comes from this information comes from a study that was done by Ligonier Ministries last year, and they found that 93% of evangelical millennials agree there is one true God in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Okay, this is Orthodox Christian theology. This is what scripture teaches. But then they found 57% agreed the Holy Spirit is a force, but is not a personal being. Do you see the contradiction there? First, they're saying, yes, the Holy Spirit is one of the three persons of the Godhead. But then in the next breath, they're saying, but actually the Holy Spirit isn't, isn't a person. He's more like a force in Star Wars. This is a contradictory belief. Either the Holy Spirit is a person of God or he is not. Then the same study found that 80% of evangelical millennials said God counts a person as righteous, not because of one's works, but only because of one's faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, again, this is what scripture teaches, that our righteousness comes from Christ alone. But then they found that 48% of evangelical millennials agree everyone sins a little, but most people are good by nature. Do you see the contradiction there? First, it's our only righteousness comes from Jesus. But actually, we're really not that bad. We're kind of good. We just need a little spot cleaning. Contradictory beliefs. And then finally, the last one we'll look at is they found that 88% of evangelical millennials agree only those who trust in Jesus Christ alone as their savior receive God's free gift of eternal salvation. Again, what scripture teaches. But then 51% agreed God accepts the worship of all religions including Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Now, if you know anything about these three religions, you know that they teach contradictory things. They cannot all be true. They could all be false, but they cannot all be true. And then they found that 41% agreed religious belief is a matter of personal opinion. It is not about objective truth. And so from these statistics, we see that many of those, even who are within the church, hold beliefs that are contrary, but they don't seem to have any problem with this. They haven't actually viewed Christianity as a trust in what God has revealed, and that's rational and that's real. And this is what we do not want for our children. We want them to understand that the Christian worldview lines up with reality. So then the question becomes, okay, so what should we do? <laughs> what is a solution to this? Now, remember, as I said before, 
Faith, true Christian faith, involves the affections of our hearts, the actions of our hands, and the thoughts of our mind. What we're going to focus on today is we're going to focus a lot on the intellectual side of things, not because it's more important than the other two, but because it tends to be the area in which we are the weakest. So that's why we're going to focus on this. Now, what should we do? The first thing that we need to do is we need to equip our children to understand the concept of truth. Now, last night, I led a whole session on equipping our children to discern and follow truth. If you missed that session, I believe that it was recorded and you can gain access to it after the conference is over. You'll get information about how to view sessions. I would highly recommend you go back and watch that session on truth because we really need to equip our children to understand the difference between objective truth and subjective feelings or preference. So truth is important, but the first step, once we've laid that foundation of truth and our children understand the difference between objective truth claims and subjective feelings or preferences, the next thing we need to do is we need to make sure that we have a game plan. We need to have some kind of strategy to make sure that we are intentional in this. Now, when I first started on this journey, when I was seeking to figure out how can I get the students in my classroom to understand the truth of the Christian worldview, I started talking to other people, just asking them how they did this, both in their classroom or in their home or with their grandkids or in their church. And, you know, the most common response that I got was, well, this happens organically. It happens in the everyday conversations that we have. It happens as I'm teaching kids math. It happens as I'm tucking my kids into bed at night. It happens as we are going to soccer practice and we're driving in the car. Now, as I started thinking through these responses, I thought, well, you know what? That makes sense. It makes sense that if Christianity is whole worldview that we are going to have these organic moments that just come up and that we have these conversations that makes sense but then i started thinking about another situation i started thinking about parent teacher conferences and i thought you know what if parents came into my classroom at parent teacher conference time and they said miss urbanowitz tell us about math what are you doing in math this year and i said oh you know what I love math so much that in this classroom, math happens organically. It happens as the students are putting away their backpacks in the morning. It happens as we're going through literature class. We have discussions. It happens as we're walking down the hallway to lunch. I knew what would happen if that was my response, that these parents would either go and report me to the administrators or they would pull their child out of my class. Why? Well, we all know that if we relegate mathematic instruction to the organic moments, our children are going to have huge gaps in their mathematic understanding. They are not going to actually become mathematicians who are capable of functioning in this world because in order to have a sound understanding of math, you have to have a plan and it has to be systematically taught. So then I thought, okay, well, If worldview development is the most important thing that I am doing with the students in my classroom, why would I relegate it just to the organic moments? I want it to be happening in the organic moments, but I also need to have a plan to make sure there's not these huge gaps in my children's understanding of the Christian worldview. So then I came up with a game plan and I just thought through, I did some research and I thought through, okay, what do I need to take these students of mine through? And we started again with truth. Then we looked at big questions that every worldview has to answer. We looked at questions such as, what should I worship? How did life begin? What does it mean to be human? How can I tell right from wrong? And we started investigating the clues that we found in life and the world around us. And then we started looking at, okay, what does scripture have to say? And we dove into scripture and we look at what does scripture say about this entire topic? And then we looked at, okay, what are other worldviews in our society? What do these worldviews teach about this topic? How are those answers similar to the biblical worldview? How are they different? So we actually started systematically going through this. 
Now I mentioned, I just mentioned how we started going through the teachings of other worldviews, as well as the teachings of the Christian worldview. And when I started doing this with the students in my classroom, I actually received a little bit of pushback from some parents, not many, but from some, and some parents were saying, oh, no, 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 no. We send our kids to a Christian school. We don't want them exposed to any other worldview. We just want them exposed to the Christian worldview. And that is sufficient. So I started to dive in and, and see what, what's behind this, because our children are exposed to other worldviews, like it or not. They don't need to actually wait until they're in a class to be exposed to counterfeit worldviews. They're exposed to them every day. So I started to dive in and say, hmm, where is this pushback coming from? And I encountered uh, an analogy that's somewhat popular in Christian circles. And the analogy goes like this. When federal agents are trained to detect counterfeit, they are not shown every single form of counterfeit that's out there. They're just shown the true currency. So therefore, when they finally encounter a counterfeit, they can pick it up like that. So therefore, the analogy goes, we do not need to expose our children to all of the other worldviews that are out there. We just need to expose them to the truth of the Christian worldview. And then when they encounter something that opposes the Christian worldview, they'll be able to pick it up like that. Now, this analogy is good up to a point. We know that our children should be exposed to the Christian worldview more than anything else. We need to be immersing our kids in the word of God. We need to be talking about it throughout the day. We need to be having our children read God's word. They should be memorizing it. However, this analogy is only good up to a point because it contains a faulty presupposition. Now, this analogy presupposes that federal agents are already thoroughly convinced that there is only one true form of currency and that that form of currency is printed and backed by the government in that country. Now, this is a pretty fair presupposition when we're talking about federal agents. However, what if federal agents weren't convinced that there was only one true form of currency? Well, then what the government would need to do in its training is they would need to take a step back and systematically build a case for why this government-backed form of currency is the one true currency. And this is the mistake that we sometimes make with our kids is we think, oh, clearly Christianity is the worldview that is true. So all I need to do is expose my kids to the Christian worldview, and then they'll be prepared to confront everything else. Well, this is a faulty presupposition in our culture because our children are bombarded with hundreds of competing ideas every day. And sure, when they're four, when they're five, when they're six, maybe when they're seven, they're still thoroughly convinced that Christianity is the one true worldview because the stage that they're at developmentally is when they will believe any word that comes out of our mouth. However, starting around age eight, this is the way that God designed it. He designed the mind so that it starts to question more. It starts to look for connections. It starts to realize that its perspective is not the only perspective. So starting around age eight, our children are no longer just going to hang on every single word that we say. They're going to start to ask why, and they're going to start slowly to push back. So what we need to do is we need to make sure that we are systematically building a case for why we can put our trust in the Christian worldview so that we're showing our kids, hey, these are big questions every worldview has to answer. Here's how Christianity answers them. Here's how other worldviews answer them. Which part of other worldviews answers are true? Which part actually line up with reality? Which parts don't? So that we are helping our children see that, yes, Christianity is the one worldview that lines up with reality. Um, Oz Guinness, if you're familiar with Oz Guinness, he has a quote that I love. And he says, contrast is the mother of clarity. I always find that I wonder at the gospel more when I see the alternatives. And that's what we want for our children. We want them to see through comparison the truth and goodness and beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So then the question for us, the question for you to ask yourself then is, what are concepts that are important to explore with the children that God has placed in your life? What concepts should you be systematically taking them through and having them explore? What do we find in the world around us? What does scripture say? What do other worldviews teach? That's an important question for each of us to think about. Now, you may be in a position 
where you're thinking, oh my goodness, this is so exciting. And you can take that question and you can run with it. You can jot down ideas. Maybe you're homeschooling your kids and you have time to go through these things with them. Or you might be thinking, that's great. I have no idea where to begin, nor do I have the time. No matter which camp you're in, do not worry. You can be equipped to do this. If you're in the camp that you're feeling like, I don't even know where to start, I would highly recommend that you go and check out the website for the ministry that I started, foundationworldview.com foundationworldview.com because this is exactly what we do. We create resources that help you systematically train the kids in your life to understand the truth of the Christian worldview. Now, when I started going through the systematic game plan with my students, it was so exciting for me to see the growth and how they started to really understand that Christianity was true. The, the second year that I did this, there was a young lady in my class and she came from a home where her mom was a Christian and her dad was an atheist. And she would sometimes come and talk with me after school about conversations that she had with her dad. Now, she and I always talked about how important it was to be respectful of her dad in all the conversations that they had, but she started going and asking him good questions. Questions like, you know, dad, if there's no God, then you know, right and wrong aren't really a thing. Right and wrong are just what who is ever in power decides. And she would start asking him questions and she'd come back and share with me conversations that they had. And it was so exciting for me to see even her as a nine-year-old was able to start thinking critically through these big issues in life and dialoguing with others about them. Okay, now we talked about the first step is we need to have a game plan. That yes, we want to have organic conversations with the kids in our life, but if we just relegate understanding the truth of the Christian worldview to these organic moments, there's going to be huge gaps in our kids' understanding. So first, we need to have a game plan. Then once we have that game plan, when we start to implement it, the second thing that we need to make sure we do is talk less and ask more questions. We need to talk less and ask more questions. Now, brain researchers have found that when we are talking, we're actually usually critically thinking through the content that we're talking about. So whoever in an interaction does the majority of the talking, typically, not always, but typically does the majority of the thinking and therefore the majority of the learning. And so this can be difficult, especially when we're thinking about the truth of the Christian worldview, because if you can't tell them, I'm just a teeny little bit passionate about this, and I hope that you are as well. And when we're passionate about something, we tend to do a lot of talking. That's one thing that, I, that I'm, I'm sad about, about the Zoom format, is usually when I'm in person, while I present, I like to give lots of processing pauses and have you do activities so that you're doing the critical thinking through this. But Zoom makes it a little bit more challenging, so I am doing a lot of the talking. Um, but in typical situations, we don't want to do so much talking. We want to do more question asking. So we need to be careful as we're passionate and we want to share the truth of the Christian worldview with our kids, that we do that and we do it in a passionate way, but that we also provide a lot of time for them to do the thinking, that we ask them questions. So now we're going to look at three things that really good questions have in common. So questions that elicit deep thinking have three things in common. I'm going to go through them really quickly, and then we're going to go through them one by one. So if you're taking notes and you're thinking, I can't write this down fast enough, don't worry, we're going to come back to it. So questions that elicit deep thinking, first, they're open-ended. Then they do not presuppose an answer. And third, they require a defense. So I'm going to share my screen with you again. And we're going to look at what this means at these different types of questions. So first, questions that elicit deep thinking, they are open-ended. Now, this is something you're probably already familiar with, open-ended questions versus closed-ended questions. Closed-ended questions require a yes or a no answer. Okay, or think about when you've asked an older child, how was your day? And he or she says, fine. <laughs> okay, that, that was a very closed response. Where open-ended questions require more than a one-word answer. So here's an example of this. This is a closed-ended question. Are the teachings of Christianity different than the teachings of other religions? So see how this is a yes or a no question. While there's so much behind this, if we ask this type of question to our kids, once we've started systematically training them because we know that most of our kids without any training couldn't really answer this question. But this one just requires a yes or a no response. A better way to word this question would be, 
How are the teachings of Christianity similar to or different than other religions? See how with this question, you can't say yes. With this question, you actually have to have a response. You either have to say, hmm, well, Christianity is similar to other religions in this way, or Christianity is different than other religions in this way. Here's another example. A closed-ended question would be, do feelings always point us to truth? Yes or no answer. It doesn't really have much of a discussion here. A way to turn this into an open-ended question would be, how do you know whether or not feelings point us to truth? So this is actually asking for a deeper, deeper thought process through this. Now, I can tell you, learning to ask open-ended questions, it takes time. I am still in this learning process. Several months ago, I was babysitting for my pastor's kids, and I was having a conversation with their five-year-old, and we were having a good conversation. And we were talking about something with, I can't remember exactly what, but something having to do with science. And I asked her, I said, do you know why the sky is blue? I asked her a closed-ended question. Do you know why the sky is blue? And she goes, yes and then moves on. Now she has absolutely no idea about the red end of the spectrum and the blue end of the spectrum with light and how we he, we see the blue end of the spectrum. But she just said yes and whoop, conversation closed. Where if I had changed that question to why do you think the sky is blue? She could have shared her response and then I could have talked with her more about it. So it takes time and it takes practice, but it's worth it. Okay, first, questions that elicit deep thinking, they're open-ended. Second, they do not presuppose an answer. Now, this one sometimes can be hard for us as Christians because a lot of times when we're so thoroughly convinced that the Christian worldview is true, it's really easy for us to ask questions that already presuppose the answer. So here's an example of a question that would presuppose an answer. How do you know Darwinian evolution is false? Okay, in this question, I've already said Darwinian evolution is false. Now you go provide evidence for my answer. So this has already presupposed an answer where we want our kids to do critical thinking. So a question that doesn't already presuppose an answer would be this. What makes you think Darwinian evolution is either true or false? We're giving our kids an opportunity to choose either side and then provide evidence for it. Now, this can be something that is intimidating. When um, several months ago, uh, this was several years ago now, before quarantine, <laughs> my mom asked me to come and observe her teach in her children's church class. My mom directs the children's program at the church that she and my dad attend. And my mom was a wonderful teacher. And afterwards, she asked me for feedback. And I mentioned all the good things she did. And I said, Mom, one thing, though, is you tend to ask questions that already presuppose an answer. They already presuppose the Christian answer. And you're just asking the kids to defend it. And she said, I know I do that, Elizabeth, but it's so scary not to. What if somebody says an answer that doesn't align with truth. And, you know, that's, that's really valid. That's a valid concern. You know, what if somebody says, well, here's what makes me think that Darwinian evolution is true and goes into a completely naturalistic response. Yeah, that can be intimidating. But the next question is, if that's what our children, if that's what the children in our care truly believe and what they're actually thinking, when do we want that to come out? Do we want that to come out now? when they're still within our homes and our churches and our schools? Or do we want it to come out later when they're at college or when they're in the workforce and finally no one is forcing them to give the Jesus answer? We want it to come out now so that we have opportunities to continue dialoguing with them. Because here's the thing, Christianity is true. It actually lines up with reality. And if we give our children the opportunity to take a non-biblical position, and ask them to defend it, they're going to keep bumping up against reality. So we wanna give them the space to do this. Another example of a question that already presupposes the answer is why does being a boy or a girl matter? So with this, we've already told the kids, being a boy or a girl matters, now defend it. A way that we can make this so that it doesn't presuppose the answer is what evidence is there that being a boy or a girl does or doesn't matter? So we're actually having them think, does it matter? Does it not matter? What evidence is there? This opens up conversations for us. 
Okay, so first, these questions, they need to be open-ended, then they need to not presuppose an answer, and then they need to require a defense. Now, we've already seen this in some of the examples that I've given you, but we want our kids to actually be used to providing evidence for the claims that they make so that they're used to thinking, is what I'm believing true or is it not? And then when they hear claims from others, they're thinking, okay, what evidence is there for this claim? So an example of a question that does not require as a defense is, do you believe we can trust the Bible? Okay, again, this is a close-ended question. Do you believe we can trust the Bible? Yes. No. A way to change this would be, what three reasons do you think best explain why we can or cannot trust the Bible? So we're asking them to actually provide reasons. Now, you may be thinking the kids in my care, there's no way that they could explain this. That's why this step is step second. That's why first we need to have the systematic game plan. We need to be equipping them with the information that they need in order to be able to answer these questions. Now, another example of this, this, this is a close-ended question, does not require a defense. Do right and wrong change over time? Yes or no? We could change this by saying, explain three pieces of evidence that show right and wrong do or do not change over time. Now, you may be thinking, I have kids that are six. There's no way that they could answer a question like that. You're right. We would need to take it down a notch and say something like, hmm, what do you think? What evidence would there be? Is hitting your brother or sister, would that be right? If we moved to another country, what makes you think that? So something that's more simple for younger children. Okay, so now we've gone through, oops, I'm gonna start, stop sharing with you here. Now we've gone through the first two steps that first we need to have a game plan. Then we need to at, we need to talk less and ask more questions. And as I started doing this in my own classroom, I started to see the students start to question things that they wouldn't have questioned before. Now you may be thinking, oh, I don't want the kids in my care to question everything. We do want them to start to question things. I know it's a lot of work, but when we equip them to question things, we're equipping them to seek truth and to not absorb lies that are all around them. And one clear example of this is I was leading a literature circle in my classroom and it was towards the end of the year. And we were reading a book that took place in Nazi Germany. And in it, the, the character had to make a decision. She found out that there was a Jewish family hiding in her home. And she had to make a decision for whether she was going to keep the Jewish family safe or whether she was going to report her parents to her um, Nazi youth group. And she, she made the right decision. She did not report them. And in the end of the book, the author closed with something, a quote, something to the effect of freedom is more important than love because if you're not free to choose whom you love there's no point anyway something to that effect and now that is a very very deep quote the relationship between love and freedom and is one more important than the other are they both equally important i thought okay this is way too big a topic for third grade going to skip over that. We're not going to address it. We're just going to talk about the end of the story. Well, as we read the end of the story, then I asked a question and one of the girls in the class said, hold on, Miss Yu, I think we need to go back and we need to talk about that last sentence. And I said, okay, well, what should we talk about? And she's like, you know, I don't think that that is true. I think that love is actually more important than freedom. And she gave some reasons to defend that. And then another student responded with a, with different evidence. And now very complicated, the relationship between love and freedom, but it was so exciting for me to see that the students in my class were critically thinking through everything that they were presented with. Okay, the third thing that we need to do, the third step after we have a systematic game plan, after we have started to talk less and ask more questions, is we need to make sure that we prioritize truth and love in relationship. Remember at the beginning of this talk, we talked about spiritual formation as a whole. It involves the heart, it involves the hand, and it involves the mind. And as we are exercising the mind, as we are equipping our children to think critically, we need to make sure that we are continuing to build relationship with them. This is when, as we look through the gospels, 
This is continually what Jesus did. He didn't come in with truth and swipe it as a hammer and, and say to everybody, here's how you're wrong. Here's the truth. I'm out of here. No, Jesus took the time to sit down with others, to ask them questions that got them thinking, to see into who they were, to let them know that they were loved. He never shied away from the truth, but he always spoke it in love in the context of relationship. So as we are equipping the kids in our life to critically think through the Christian worldview, we need to make sure that we are keeping an open relationship with them. Now, obviously, this looks different in different contexts. If we're talking about the children that God has placed into our family, that's going to look different than our relationship with the children in a Sunday school class or the children in our neighborhood. But we need to think through what is an appropriate, open, loving relationship with these children that God has placed in my life. Now, we need to we need to make sure in this that we are never shying away from the truth. We don't shy away from the truth because that is not the loving thing to do. But we need to be wise relationally. Now, some things that this involves that we might not think of is, first of all, humility. That if we want to keep an open relationship with the children that God has placed in our life, we need to approach that relationship with humility. And that involves repentance. That if we look at Genesis chapter three, we saw we see that right away sin broke down relationship, that sin always cuts down relationship. And you know what? You and I are sinners and by God's grace, our sin has been washed away. And by God's grace, we stand justified before him. And by God's grace, the Holy Spirit is, is sanctifying us, conforming us more and more into the image of the son. But until we are actually in the presence of Jesus, we are never going to stop sinning here on earth. And we're going to continually sin against those who we are in relationship with. And so we need to make sure that as we are systematically training our children to understand the truth of the Christian worldview, that we're asking the Holy Spirit to make it very clear when we sin against them. And that when we do, we go and we model what it is like to ask for forgiveness, that we model repentance saying, I did this against you. This was sin. Will you forgive me? Really important because if we speak truth, but then we don't care about our relationship with the children God has placed in our care, they're not going to receive that truth. Another thing to think through, and this is not a very popular idea in our culture, but we also need to think through the way that we discipline the children that God has placed in our care. Again, this is going to look different if we are the child's parents versus if we are are working with this child in educational or in a church setting, but discipline is important that nowadays it's very popular, you know, to just think, you know, let the kids, you do you let the kid be him or her, his or her authentic self, but no, we need to hold our children lovingly to the right standard. And we need to be consistent with the way that we discipline them. So these are the three things we need to think through. First, we need to have a game plan. What are we going to do? How are we going to systematically equip our kids to understand the truth of the Christian worldview, to see that biblical faith is not blind faith. It is evidence-based trust. Then we need to practice talking less and asking more questions and thinking through those open-ended questions, those questions that don't presuppose an answer and that require a defense. And then third, we need to prioritize truth and love in relationship. Now, in a couple of minutes, we're going to wrap up this session. So if you have any questions from what we went through, please type them into the chat right now. And in about three or four minutes, we'll begin to go through those. Now, one thing to remember is when we're talking about truth and the truth of the Christian worldview, we tend to want everything to be perfect right now. And that's understandable. We want the children God has placed in our care to understand the truth of the Christian worldview. But one thing we need to remember is that this is not a sprint. This is a marathon. We don't want children who just regurgitate the right answer today and walk away from the truth of the Christian worldview five years down the road. We need to remember this is a marathon. And so we need to set out like a marathon that we're in this for the long haul with the children that God has placed in our life. 
Now I saw this recently with one of the students who God had played, who God has placed in my care. Um, she was in my class when I was teaching third grade and now she's in high school. And a couple of years ago, her mom texted me and she said, could you be praying for this, for my daughter? She's starting to doubt God's existence. And I said, of course, I'll be praying for her. Can I also take her out for ice cream? Because I know that with talking about truth, relationship is also very important. So I took her out for ice cream and we were chatting for a while about a whole bunch of different things. And then I, you know, I broached the subject and I said, Hey, you know, your mom says that you're starting to wonder whether or not God exists. Tell me some more about this. And she hung her head and she said, you know, I, I just, you know, I pray all the time and I talk to God about so many different things, but I don't ever see him answering my prayers. And you know what? I'm starting to think maybe this is just what my parents have always told me this is true. You know, maybe God's not really there. And I looked at her and I, I kind of surprised her a little bit. I said, oh, this is so exciting. And she looked at me kind of like I had five heads. And I said, you are going to start to critically think through what you believe. And you're going to figure out, is this just what your parents and your teachers and your friends have told you? Or is this actually true? And so because I had already done the prep work, I had already had a systematic game plan when she was in my care, I said, you know, just if you decide that you do not believe that Christianity is true and you believe that another worldview is true, you, you're not just going to shed Christianity and have no worldview. You're going to have another worldview. So think back, what are some big questions that worldviews have to answer? And so she, she thought back and she named a couple of questions and I said, I said, yeah, I'm so glad you remember that. I said, pick one of those questions, pick just one of those questions. And she picked a question. I said, okay, I want you to think back. What are the different options? What are different ways that worldviews answer that question? And so she, she actually remembered so much more than I expected. And she was talking and talking and talking and her ice cream is, you know, melting and dripping down her arm. And all of a sudden in the middle of a sentence, she goes, she looks at me and goes, oh, and I said, what? And she said, I, I'm, I'm just realizing that all the evidence, when I think about this question, points to the truth of the Christian worldview. Like it's actually going to be more difficult for me to believe that God doesn't exist than to believe that he does because all of this evidence points towards Christianity. You know, I guess if I don't feel like God is real, that's my feeling, but it doesn't actually line up with what is true. And I said, isn't that interesting? And that was so exciting for me to see that. Now, this isn't the end of her faith journey. It's not the end of her questions, of her uncertainties. It's certainly not the end of the difficult times that she's going to go through. But it was so exciting for me to see. You know, I didn't have to sit down, you know, give her a long lecture about why Christianity is true and why she, you know, she shouldn't walk away from the faith. I just asked her a couple of simple questions. And because we had already done that groundwork of having a plan of going through systematically what other worldviews believe, I was then able to ask her several open-ended questions in the context of relationship. And she was able to come to the conclusion on her own that, oh my goodness, Christianity is true. It lines up with reality. Now, I told you at the, at the beginning of this session that right now God has called me outside of the classroom so that I can begin equipping other adults, parents and church leaders and teachers and grandparents and aunts and uncles to equip them with the skills that they need to equip their kids to understand the truth of the Christian worldview. So if you're interested in finding out more about this, about getting resources that you can begin implementing tomorrow with the kids that God has placed in your care, go to foundationworldview.com. And if you're interested in any of the resources that we have available for you, if you use the coupon code MC25 for Mission Connection, and then 25, MC25, it will give you $25 off of our materials. So that is the end of our presentation for today. But now we're going to go to questions. So if anyone has any questions, did we have any questions in the chat? All right, so we had a question, but I think you kind of answered it already, but um, I'll, I'll read it again. Any website resources from your teaching or others to share with parents? 
Yes, that's a great question because it's always helpful to have resources. So I just shared with you that my website, foundationworldview.com, that we have resources that you can begin implementing tomorrow with the kids that God has placed in your care. And we systematically take you through the truth of the Christian worldview. And then in April, we have more materials that are coming out, some for preschoolers and then others for older students that are 10 to 14. Then some free resources that we have available. We have a blog on that website, but there's also other websites as well. If you are familiar with Mama Bear Apologetics, they have a lot of great articles that talk about different conversations that you can have with your kids, as well as their book. Their Mama Bear Apologetics book is a great resource. Uh, Natasha Crane is also another great resource. She blogs at christianmomthoughts.com or .org. I, I forget what the ending is, but it's Christian Mom Thoughts, and she has three different books that talk about how you can have conversations with your kids. So all of those are great resources to begin helping you in whatever ministry context that God, um, that God has called you in. All right. And I placed the name of your website, um, in the chat. I'm going to do it again. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, I appreciate that. But also there's more questions here. Um, let's see. Is there a difference in the approach if you're caring for kids who are a little older or teenagers? Yeah, so that is a great question. Um, so depending on the developmental level of the kids that in your care, depends on how you're going to approach this. Now, it's real. It's best if we can begin approaching this systematically when kids are eight or even a little bit younger, just simply because that's when critical thinking skills begin to start. So if we wait until they're 10, 12, 14, it's not like it's hopeless. It is not hopeless. God is always on the throne. But if we wait until those older ages, what we have to do is we have to start tearing down some of those faulty ways of thinking and rebuild them. So then the work that we do has to be reformative in nature rather than strictly formative. So that's why I always recommend starting around the eight, nine age, or even a little younger. If you can, if you're working with older children, then you are going to have to tear down some of those faulty assumptions. If you're working with high schoolers, some great resources for them. If you go to Sean McDowell's website, I believe he gave a talk at Mission Connection last night. He has some great resources. Another great resource for older um, children, like we're talking about high school or even college. If you go to axis.org, A-X-I-S, they have great kits, conversation kits that they're, they're video ones. They're constantly updating them that you can go through and use as conversation starters with your kids. So for older kids, those are some great resources. For younger kids, it's anything you can do to get their bodies involved is great because especially even in those pre-reading years, one thing we talked about last night in the truth session, it's even just beginning to get them to think about the difference between something that's true and false and just coming up with a signal, like just having them spread out their arms and say true when you say something that's true or having them make their arms into an X or curl up into a ball or something when something's false. But when you're working with younger kids, anything you can do to get their bodies involved is really great. So these are great questions. Thank you. And so in the beginning, you referenced a study. What study yes. was that? Yes. So that was a study that was done by the Barna Group back in 2011. And the results from that study are found in a book called You Lost Me. So it's You Lost Me. It was published in 2011. And the author is David Kinneman. So You Lost Me. It provides a lot of really helpful information just about why young adults have left the faith and things that we can do to help stop that. So really good questions. I'm putting this all in the chat. Thank you. And another thing that's going to appear in the chat, we're going to, if there's no more questions, um, we'll end this session since the next session is so close on its heels. Um, but there's going to be a link for a survey that if you can complete that, and if you can complete that, that's very helpful, both for Mission Connection and for me, it's helpful for Mission Connection for them to know what sessions you found helpful, what you didn't, things that you would like to see again, things that you would like differently. And then for me as a speaker, they do share these results. And I always read all of them because it's 
helpful for me to know what things were beneficial to you in the ministry context God has placed you in and what things were not beneficial because I'm always seeking to grow and to make sure what I'm doing is um, efficient and hopefully Lord willing effective. So if you could take a few minutes to fill that out, that would be wonderful. So I'm going to um, end our time here together so that you can take a moment to fill out that survey and then head over to your next session. Um, the next session I'm leading is one on how we can equip our kids to navigate the LGBTQ movement in truth and love. We're going to take a little bit of a different twist on that. So if you're interested in that, I'd love to see you there. Thank you so much for giving up an hour of your day and may God bless you as you continue to equip the little ones and the big ones in your life to understand the truth of the Christian worldview. The question is, when is the next session? I believe it's 1130, right? Uh, it's actually 1115. Oh, <laughs> so 1115. 10 minutes, so okay. <laughs> very quick, but we'll get there soon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. So it's 1115. <laughs>